God is. Do we not need constant people in our lives to point us to what really matters? Because we get easily distracted, right? We can, be, we can even become preoccupied with, with things that aren't necessarily inherently evil, but they're just a distraction. What, what's distracting us lately? What, what do you think? What, just throw a few things out there. What's a distraction? Politics. How do you guys? Politics. My shirt. Uh, f- just to mention, you know, because that's the game. Every Sunday is like, what's on Scott's shirt today? Today's kind of obvious, but we got Mike over there. Look at this. Here's how I'm influencing people. Mike's got corn dogs on his shirt. Mike, we've got, where's Lucas? Where, where, what do you got in your shirt today? Pineapples. What else? We got any other cool pattern shirts out here? No? Well, soon every dude in this church is going to be wearing pat- pattern shirts. I just have a feeling, so. Uh, here's to corn dogs, pineapples, and watermelon, right? Uh, so what's distracting us today? Scott's shirt, Mike's shirt, Lucas's shirt. Uh, politics, what else? Work, Work. Health. health, finances. Lots distracting us. Yeah, I know, yeah, sometimes, right? Depends how you look at it, right? Um, I saw this picture. I want to show you this picture. What is this picture? I mean, since you guys brought it up first, I'm just, I'm just saying, you guys brought it up first. What's, what's this picture communicate? <laughs> is this not perhaps the best reminder right now? This is, this is good tattoo fodder right here. If you're thinking about getting a tattoo, maybe this would be a good one right here. Uh, a friend of mine posted one that had a lion greater than donkey and elephant. Uh, I don't like that one. This one's more in line with Scripture. Here's, here's the thing, you guys. We have to, we are obsessed with the wrong things. We are, someone said first service, technology. Technology, right? Any news, this just mass intake of just information. Can I just encourage us this morning? I did this first service. We're going to do a second. Turn off your phones. Put your phones down. Put your devices down. Uh, some of you are like, but I don't have a Bible. Well, good news is we do. Uh, Kim, can you grab that stack of Bibles right there? Uh, you need a Bible with, here's, here's what I want to hear this morning. This. Now, some of you are like, I have an app for that. That, that sounds like pages turning. Anyone that needs a Bible? Elijah, you want to pass these out to people? Lights, uh, my rugby man, he's, he's all ready for rugby today. Uh, turn off your phones. Turn off your phones. Turn off your devices. You don't need technology. What we need is to listen to the word this morning. And let me just tell you, you're going to get a lot of word today. So take out your pen, pencil. We're going old school. Take out your spiral bounder, binder, your peachy folder. I don't know what pink, pink. Pink, whatever. Um, you're going to take some notes. Exodus chapter 12. Because here's the thing, you guys, we, we have to understand the lamb is the most important animal in the Bible. Not the lion. Not the bear. Not the donkey. Not the elephant. The kingdom of the elephant will be destroyed. The kingdom of the donkey will fade. But the kingdom of the Lamb is forever. I'm going to prove that here in a moment. The party of the Lamb is the most important party in the world. And sometimes our allegiances are way off the mark. Our commitments are not reflective of what what the Son of God has done for us. So this morning, I don't want us to be obsessed with our country, I want us to be obsessed with our heavenly country that will reign forever. I don't just want us to be obsessed with governors and princes and presidents and I want us to be obsessed with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the only true Prince of Peace that matters. So this morning, I want us to forsake all things in light of learning about the most important animal in the Bible, the Lamb. Because what does it profit a person? 
if you gain your place in politics and lose your soul? What does it profit a person if you have downloaded every app that just brings you so much satisfaction and enjoyment of life and lose your soul? What does it profit a person if you get that relationship, get that job, achieve victory in whatever hobby or pursuit you're, you're looking at and lose your soul? Your soul is the most important thing about you this morning. And it's that soulish part of who we are I want us to focus on because this is what the lamb addresses. If you were with us last week, we talked about the, the lamb as it pertains to the, the last plague to, to come upon Egypt in the book of Exodus. And it was the sacrifice of a lamb that, that saved families. If you don't understand how important the lamb is in Scripture, you will not understand the Scriptures. Because the lamb is the most important part of the Bible, it serves us well to look at this, this picture. of Last week we saw the tenth plague, the plague of the, the destroyer who would come throughout the land and, and bring judgment upon every house that wasn't covered by the lamb's blood. And this was true for Egypt and Israel because Every single person born into this world is born a sinner and deserving of God's wrath. Here's the good news. Our God's a God of grace and mercy. He gives us an out. He is patient. He is long-suffering. And it's his kindness that leads us to repentance. And all those in Exodus 12 last week that we saw whose homes were covered by the blood of the Lamb were spared. See, God is not just a God of justice and wrath. He's also a God of mercy and grace. And Yet we understand that picture of what happened in Exodus 12 to be a reflection of a greater picture that we're going to uncover this morning. So let's look at Exodus chapter 12. We're going to just continue the narrative, and we're going to see a lot of kind of repetition here, and this is why we're going to kind of breeze through this rather quickly, because there's three more important points I want to talk about as we pivot away from Exodus chapter 12, because I just felt like this is just too important a topic to pass up. So we get to talk about the lamb today. We get to talk about how Passover uh, in Exodus is a greater Passover that, re that relates to all of our lives. And we're going to see why this is important. So Exodus chapter 12, starting at verse 29. If you would, with me, um, consider these truths found in, in Exodus. And not to mention the songs that we sang this morning. So uh, everything points us to the lamb. Doug pointed us to the lamb in communion. From uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the songs, think about how many of the songs we sang today. Every song we sang pointed to the Lamb. Can I remind you just, and I wrote this down. I wrote these, I was going through the lyrics going, what are we singing? Think about this. The Lamb has brought us forgiveness. The Lamb has conquered death. The Lamb has overcome. The Lamb, ha lamb has rescued us. The Lamb has arrested death. The Lamb has redeemed us. The Lamb has released us. The Lamb has ransomed us. The Lamb has canceled our debt. The precious blood of Jesus has brought forgiveness, acceptance, grace, and has allowed us to be overcomers in Him. We sang that today. And some of you are like, all I know is I heard a good beat. But did you hear the message? Did you hear the message that there's the song of the Lamb that is sung by the people of the Lamb, that the Lamb has brought us this incredible victory of salvation? What an amazing thing it is. Exodus 20, 12, verse 29. Look at this. So we, we're going to continue where we left off last week. Now it came about that at midnight, so God said, I'm coming at midnight. The Lord struck all the firstborn in the land. So here was the warning. Every firstborn will die. Not only of humans, but of cattle as well. Unless you do what I've told you to do, and that is take an innocent lamb, be friends with it for four days, name it, play, play with it, coddle it, come totally close and connected to it, and then slit its throat, take the blood, and put it on your doorpost. And when the destroyer flies over the land at midnight, the homes that are covered shall be spared. So the Lord comes through on his promise, his warning, strikes down all the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who's in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. God is no respecter of persons. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Whether you have the highest position in the land or whether you're the lowest servant in the land, everyone is a born sinner and deserving of God's wrath. 
And Pharaoh rose in the night, and he and all his servants and the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt. Can you imagine the wailing? So you have some homes where there's the sound of bleating sheep who are being slaughtered, and other homes where there's weeping and wailing because their children, the parents, any of the firstborn are dead. What a dark moment in human history. And Pharaoh rose... There's this cry, and there was no, no home where there was not someone dead. He called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, Rise up, get out, and go worship the Lord as you have said. Both, take both your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and go. But while you're on your way out, bless me. This guy still hasn't learned, has he? He's the most selfish, self-absorbed person at the moment. Hey, while you guys leave, would you just stop and bless me? You've had your chance to bend your knee. You've had your chance to come to know the Lord God of the universe. Our God has conquered the gods of Egypt. That's what Moses and Aaron are going to tell him, right? So he basically says, get up, go out, and just leave. We've had it with you. And even the people along with Pharaoh, in verse 33, the Egyptians urged the people to send them out of the land with haste, for they said, we shall all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened with their kneading bowls bound up in clothes on their shoulders. Sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses. And they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver, gold, clothing. The Lord had given people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they let them have the request. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. So this is the moment, we talked about this last week, where they get back pay from the Egyptians. Plundering is a sign of victory and overcoming. And that's what the people of Israel are, are claiming because their God is an overcoming God. And they are getting more than they need for their journey. And the people of Egypt willingly give them that which they deserve. Now the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramses to Succoth, about 600,000 men on foot, aside from women and children. So we're looking at about 2 million people making the exodus. And in this 2 million, there's a mixed multitude, verse 38, which means some of the Egyptians have come to show interest in the God of of the Israelites. So not all who left Egypt are pure Israel. Some of them are a mixed multitude, Through the plagues, the people were going, maybe this God of Moses is the real deal. So they all leave together, flocks, herds, livestock, and they bake the dough. Uh, Verse 39, which they had brought out of Egypt into cakes, unleavened bread, for they had not become leavened yet. So they were driven out of Egypt and could not delay. Now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. That's a long time. Yet God had predicted in Genesis 15 with Abraham said, your people will be captive in in another nation for 400 plus years. And I will deliver them. 430 years is a long time for God to work, isn't it? Sometimes God's timetable is different than our timetable. Amen. Have you been waiting for God to do something? Some of you can't wait for God to do something in 430 seconds, much less 430 years. Can I get an amen from somebody? Somehow God is saying, hey, I've got you. I know you. I'm looking out for you. My promise for you will happen. We don't know when, but God's promises are always yes and amen in Christ Jesus. We'll talk about that here in a moment. Verse 42, it is a night to be observed for the Lord, having brought them out of the land of Egypt. This night is for the Lord to be observed by all the sons of Israel throughout their generations. Passover is not just a one-time event. This moment will mark now the most important holiday in Jewish households, Passover. Every year, Jewish families will celebrate the Passover to remember the deliverance of their people from Egypt, some 1500 B.C. That's about the date. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, this is the ordinance of Passover, that uh, no foreigner is to eat of it. This is why Douglas, during communion, said, Lord's Supper communion is for believers only. Because we do not want to honor God with our lips when our hearts are not, are, are not connected to his, when, when our, our hearts are far from him. Here's what we want for you to do as a church. We don't want you to take communion. We don't want you to be baptized. We want you to love and adore and worship the King, Je- King Jesus alone. Amen? And then once you come to be a part of this faithful community, then take communion. Then be baptized. Right, Because it's a dangerous thing to associate externally with Christ, but internally be vacuous of him. So let no foreigner, sojourner, hire servant, verse 45, right? It is to be eaten in a single house. So salvation begins with you, but then it plays out into community. Look at verse 47. All the congregation of Israel are to celebrate this. Your faith in Christ is not purely or merely an individualistic experience. 
We need each one another. This is what's called the church. And we sometimes treat the church as if it's optional. Can I just tell you, this gathering, this assembly that the Bible says, do not forsake this for anything, comes as a priority in our lives because you need me, I need you, and we need to come together to get our alignment in, 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 in corrected. Because I'll tell you what, we have become slaves to things that are so less important than the church. Your football team does not matter compared to the party of the Lamb. Amen? Your uh, kid's sports, you know, does not mean you miss out on church. You find ways to accommodate the gathering. This is important. I wish I could call in on a Sunday and be like, I just don't feel like it. But some of you are like, yeah, because that's what we pay you to do, right? Trust me, there's been times I want to call Pastor Davey and be like, dude, you got a message ready? I don't want to come to church today. But even if I wasn't paid to do what I do, I'd still want to be with you. And I'd find every, every excuse to be here rather than find every excuse not to be here. We need each other, amen? I got one guy who's with me, right? Free coffee for that guy. So I'm like, is that all it takes? <laughs> we need each other. Bible says, do not forsake the assembly together where we are able to spur one another with love and good works. Because there's no other congregation in the world that's doing what we're doing today. The party of the Lamb is the, la- the party you need to belong to through and through. This is priority number one. But if a stranger sojourns with you and celebrates the Passover, the Lord let him and his males be circumcised. So let them be adopted into the faith community. The same law applies to the native, to the stranger, the sojourns among you. So all the sons of Israel did so just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And it came about on the same day that the Lord brought the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. May God write his eternal truths upon our hearts today. So we're going to leave Exodus 12 behind. This is where we're going to pivot today. And we're going to talk about the party of the Lamb because the principles of what we have just looked at need to be fleshed out some more. Three things we're going to look at this morning that I hope will serve as encouragement to you. For those of you who may be outside of Christ, I pray today's message would bring you inside Christ. I pray that those of you who are in Christ would be encouraged in your faith in Christ. Because to be honest with you, and this is not hyperbole or hyperbole or however you want to pronou- pronounce it, um, this, is, this is perhaps the most important message I could ever preach. As a matter of fact, I would preach this message till the day I die because there's no more message more important than this. That the party of the Lamb is the most important party to belong to, considering what the Lamb has done for us. But let's go back and talk about why this is important. Number one, because there are promises made in the Bible that have everything to do with the Lamb of God. From the very beginning, God has had a plan to redeem people. And I'm so grateful for this. He could have let us die. He could have let us all die in our sins. But he chose there to be a plan of redemption. It goes back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to have a lot of verses for you today. There's going to be verses I'm going to have up on the screen and a lot of verses I'm just going to reference. I'm going to tell you right now, give it up for Debbie on the slides back there. Debbie, she gets an extra coffee today. She gets an extra coffee today and maybe a breakfast burrito. So we we might really just take care of her. her. Don't pull a hammy, all right? Don't pull any muscles. Do this. This is finger exercise. Like, get ready to go, right? We're going to give you tons of verses. Prepare to write these down in your notes because you're going to want to look at them later. But promise is made. Starts Genesis 3.15, the first mention of the gospel in the Bible. It's, the, it's when God says to the serpent, right? He's already talked to, to Adam. He's already talked to Eve. Their, their, their sin of disobedience, their sin of rebellion. He says to the serpent, you know what, I'm gonna br- there's going to be enmity between your seed and her seed. Your seed is going to strike her seed on the heel, but her seed is going to crush your head. Now, what's interesting, biologically, he talks about her seed. We know biologically the woman doesn't provide the seed when it comes to reproduction. Who provides the seed? The man. Do you guys need pictures or videos? No, we're not going to do that this morning. So the man provides the seed, which is interesting because in verse 3, uh, chapter 3, f- uh, verse 15 of Genesis, we have the first mention of the virgin birth. 1,500 plus years before Jesus would arrive on the scene. And that there's going to be enmity between the enemy and, and Jesus. The enemy is going to, throughout history, try to sabotage the work of the lamb. But the lamb will overcome. 
Because nothing can thwart the purposes of our God. Amen? So the promise that began in Genesis 3, verse 15, works throughout Scripture, all the way through Noah, through Abraham, through Moses, through David. Everything points to the fact that there's a Messiah coming, that redemption is for God's people, and God is sure enough going to make sure his plan comes to fulfillment. In case you want to know some verses, I'm going to have you write down, write down this, this verse, 2 Corinthians verse one, uh, chapter 1, verse 20. I, I have it up on the screen for you. Because here's the remarkable thing about promises made in Scripture, is that not one promise God made has, uh, has not come into fruition or fulfillment. That Christ is, as this verse says, the answer to all God's promises. Nothing that matters is ever found outside of Christ. Here's what Paul says. For all the promises of God, how many of God's promises? All. Find their yes in Jesus. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Can I get an amen? That's what Paul says to do. As he's writing to the church, he says, can, I just, can you just imagine like the face of Paul just being like, I can't believe I'm writing this. All the promises of God are yes in Christ. There is no reality, there is no meaning, there is nothing significant more important than that which is found in the personal work of Jesus Christ. And this is why we utter amen to God for his glory. So what's amazing is there's not one section of scripture that doesn't point to the coming Messiah. All the people in the Old Testament were saved by faith, just like all the people in the New Testament and to our present day look back to the personal work of Jesus. Everyone is saved by faith. They are not saved by their sacrifices. They're not saved by their observances. They're not saved by all their, all their religious activity. They are saved by faith. Old Testament, New Testament, central figure, personal work of Jesus Christ. Do you have that? And there's not one page of the Bible where Jesus is not found on. Do you believe that? Have you ever considered it? Let me just give you a list. I did this first service. Uh, I almost hemorrhaged. I hope I don't hemorrhage this service, all right? So how Jesus is found on every book of the Bible. You guys ready for this? It's only going to take a couple minutes. In Genesis, Jesus is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our high priest. In Numbers, he's the pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's the prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he's the commander of the Lord's army. In Judges, he's the judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In 1 and 2 Samuel, he's the seed of David. Kings and Chronicles, he's our reigning king. In Ezra, he's our faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's the rebuilder of everything broken. In Esther, he's our Mordecai, our advocate. Job, he's our ever living redeemer. In Psalms, he's our shepherd. In Proverbs, he's our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he's our meaning of life. In Song of Solomon, he's our loving bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, Lamentations, he's our weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's the glorious Lord. In Daniel, he's the fourth man in the fiery furnace. In Hosea, he's the faithful husband. In Joel, he's the outpour of the Holy Spirit. How's that so far? You guys want more? Okay, good. Amos, he's our burden bearer. bearer. In Ob Obadiah, he's our judge and savior. In Jonah, he's the risen prophet. In Micah, he's the ruler in the world of Bethlehem. Nahum, he's our stronghold. In Habakkuk, he is the watchman. In Zephaniah, he's mighty to save. In Haggai, he is the restorer. In Zechariah, he is the branch of David, the one pierced for us. In Malachi, he is the son of righteousness. Now, that's just Old Testament, 39 books. You guys ready for 27 more? Here we go. New Testament. Matthew, he's the king of the Jews. Messiah, Christ, son of God. Mark, he's the servant, miracle worker. Luke, he's the baby in the manger, son of man. John, he's the son of God, a living word, the way, the truth, and the life. Acts, he's the Savior of the world, the ascended Lord. Romans, he's the justifier. First Corinthians, he's the resurrection. Second Corinthians, he's our comfort. Galatians, he's our liberty. Ephesians, he's the head of the church. Philippians, he's our joy. Colossians, he's our completeness, the one holding our world together. First, second, Thessalonians, he's the coming king. First and second, Timothy, he's our mediator. Philemon, he's our benefactor. Titus, he's our blessed hope. Hebrews, he's our perfection. James, he's the power behind our faith. First, second, Peter, he's the chief shepherd, chief cornerstone. First, second, third, John, he's our truth and everlasting life. Judy, he's the foundation of our faith, our security. Revelation, He's the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. You tell me the word's boring. You tell me the Bible's like, yeah, I just don't have time for it. The Word of God, every letter, every chapter, every page of it contains the truth that God's promises are yes and amen in Christ. And if God's promises are made in the Old Testament, God's promises are kept in the New Testament. Write those two phrases down because that's going to kind of help you understand the Bible in four words. How do I understand the Bible? First half or first part of the Bible, the Old Testament, promises made. Second half or second part, the New Testament, promises kept. 
Promises made, com- promises kept, all come together that they're the yes and amen in Christ Jesus, that God is faithful to fulfill his word on behalf of his redeemed people. Point number two is this, pointers given. So just like I mentioned to you with just reading that list of, of books and kind of their common themes, all throughout scripture you have pointers of, of what the Messiah will do, right? So even though these are literal pointers, oftentimes there's also a figurative edge. They are symbolic of something else. If you remember uh, the Ark of Noah, right? This is what Noah is most famous about, right? The great flood that came upon the world and Noah built this gigantic ark. Well, the, the, the true ark that saves you is not the one that, that, that Moses built, but the ark that is Jesus himself. And if you're found in the ark, you're protected from the flood of God's judgment. Amen? That's what we would call a pointer. We would call these things types, uh, shadows, symbolic pictures of things yet to come. Passover is a picture of a greater reality. See, the Passover in Exodus 12 saved people physically. It didn't save anyone spiritually. What saves you spiritually is not religious activity. What saves you spiritually is the faith that believes a God who commands things and you obey them. By faith, you trust him. And so Passover, while this is symbolic, even though it's history, it's symbolic, Christ is the capital P Passover who saves us from our sins. Amen? So what we have to understand is that throughout the scripture, We have pictures of the ark, Jonah's whale, the scapegoat in Leviticus, the bronze serpent lifted up in numbers, right? That even Jesus says, I'm the bronze serpent lifted up, and if you want to be healed from the sting of death, you look unto me to be saved. So Jesus constantly is, is saying that all the things that the law and the prophets spoke about, they point to me. Everything in Scripture points to Jesus. Hebrews 10 tells us about this pretty clearly. Check this out, Hebrews chapter 10. If you want to read the book of Hebrews, fantastic letter given that shows the superiority of Christ over everything. Over religion, over sacrificial systems, over angels. Christ is superior over everything. Here's a chapter 10 of Hebrews says, For since the law has but a shadow of the good things to come, so the law, meaning... That which God has, ex- has disclosed about his expectation of you, the law cannot save us. The law can only condemn us. This is why I'm not a huge fan of the Ten Commandments. I mentioned this last week, and I didn't get any hate mail. So, so kudos to you guys yet, I should say, right? But uh, the law cannot save us. It can only show us how far we fall short of what God commands. So here's the law. It's but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. It can never be by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every you make perfect those who draw near. Meaning, you cannot obey the law. All of us fall short of doing that. None of us can do, do enough sacrifices to make God like us. This is why then the writer of Hebrews says this. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having once been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sin? No, but look at how it continues here. The writer says in in verse 3 and 4, but in these sacrifices there is a reminder reminder of sins every year for it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So every system that God set up for Israel in the Old Testament were merely pointers to a greater reality. Your religious activity doesn't save you. Faith in the God who has commanded these things that points to a greater reality that the Messiah will be the atonement for your sins is what will save you. This is why God says, why do you come to me offering the blood of bulls and goats when your heart is far from me? I desire obedience, not sacrifice. Ladies and gentlemen, may we understand the, the central role of Christ in all of these things. This is why when it came to Passover, this was the last thing Jesus did with his disciples before he went to be crucified. Isn't it interesting 
that Christ would die the same week as Passover is being celebrated in Jerusalem. As a matter of fact, when Jesus had the triumphal entry into Jerusalem was the same day all the hundreds of thousands of sheep would be led into the city to be prepared for sacrifice. He didn't come to celebrate Passover. He came to become the Passover. So he's with his men assembled in the upper room. They have all the elements of Passover there. But isn't it interesting, there's no mention of the lamb, which would be a customary table, you know, thing that, that would be there. And I wonder how many disciples were sitting at the table and going, hey, we're here for Passover, where's the lamb? And like Jesus is almost giving them like a smirk saying, you're looking at him. But I don't think it was that, I think it was more intense than that. Matter of fact, it says that Jesus' heart was stirred the night he met with his, his men because all his life had been aiming for this, this specific moment. If you think about it, his earthly ministry starts by being baptized by John, and John the Baptist sees Jesus coming towards him in John chapter 1 and says, Behold the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. This would be the message that would loom over Christ in his earthly ministry for the next several years. He was born to die. Think about as a kid, his parents would be faithful in going to the temple, observing all the, the Passovers and the Day of Atonements and stuff like that. Imagine Jesus seeing all the lambs being slaughtered on Passover year after year after year, realizing one day he would be the Passover. So his heart was, was heavy. As he met with the disciples and they have the, the bread and they have the, the wine, but there's no lamb because he's the lamb. You know who else uttered that same question, where is the lamb? It would be Abraham and Isaac. Remember when God said, hey, Abraham, take your son, your only son, the one I promised that I would bless the world through. Go ahead and take him up the mountain, sacrifice him. And by faith, Abraham did what God had commanded him to do. And if you remember, Isaac is walking up the mountain carrying wood up this, this hill. Remember who else carried wood up a hill to lay down his life for us? So Isaac goes up into the mountain. They prepare the altar. And Isaac says to his dad, where's the sacrifice? Abraham says, God will provide. Puts his son on the altar, preparing to kill his only son. How many of us would be able to go through that, that love of obedience? Here's what Abraham knew, that God is a God of the resurrection. This is why Abraham was ready to kill his only son, because he knew God had the power to raise the dead. But the moment he was ready to plunge that knife into his only son's heart, they hear a provision being made in the bushes, a sacrifice had its head stuck in thistles and thorns. Do you know another substitute that had his head stuck in thistles and thorns? God provided the sacrifice. And so, where's the lamb? The disciples would soon understand that the lamb that had been spoken of all throughout the Old Testament was sitting at their table, ready to give his life. And the very next day at twilight, when the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Lamb of God would breathe his last and die for us is the same moment that all the other Passover lambs would give their lives as well for those families celebrating Passover. Which brings me to my last point. Provision supplied. Because here's what God requires. A life. See, it's not the life of the lamb that is celebrated in Exodus 12. It's not the life of the lamb that we celebrate in the Gospels. It's the death of the lamb. And here's what God demands. He demands a life. This is what happened in Egypt. Every home had a life taken. It was either a human life or it was an animal life. Now, praise God that we are not here to celebrate some beast. We are here to celebrate the one who is fully God and fully human. His name is Jesus. Who was fully God 
and yet fully human so that he can identify with us in every travail and trial and difficulty that we go through. And what we have to realize is that God did not spare even his own son to send his son to be our rescue, our redeemer, our salvation. The true hero of the story is the lamb. Now I want to tell you a funny story about a lamb in which I was the hero of the story. Uh, What mom or dad is not the hero in a young child's eyes when that parent rescues a stuffed animal, finds a lost toy? We're in San Diego. Our kids are little. My daughter has a little stuffed animal named Lammy. Talk about kids coming up with creative names for their stuffed animals, right? How many kids have gotten a shark? And you're like, what's its name? Sharky. Boy, that's super creative. Good. good. Go with it. All right. So, so my daughter had Lammy, and we're in San Diego as, as, a, as a family, and we're on this busy, uh, it's rush hour traffic, and my daughter decides to roll down the window and throw Lammy out on the freeway. And then she starts crying over this, and you're sitting there going, like, good riddance, right? Like, you deserve, no. As a parent, you shift into compassion mode, mercy mode, right? So what does dad do? Dad puts on his superhero cape and says, we're going to go get Lammy on the busy San Diego freeway. So dad takes the next off-ramp, loops around, comes back around, and in his big, cool minivan with five kids, Five family members inside, stock full of boogie boards and, and, and umbrellas. Dad, in the middle of the rush hour traffic on San Diego Freeway, finds Lammy all run over, dirty, but yet re- rescues Lammy and gives him back, gives him back to her, his daughter. Who's the hero of the story? Dad. Dad rescued Lammy, and she still remembers that to this day. But lest we rob God of his glory... It is never about us rescuing anything or anyone. It is about God rescuing us, and he does it by means of his lamb. God is the hero of the story. He is the hero of my story. He is going to be the hero of your story, I hope. He's the hero of the story for all of eternity. And all God's people said, why is he the hero? Six things I want to focus on as we just close out our time. And I'm going to give you a huge amount of information. Michael, I think it was you and I talked about last week. You said, if there's 50 ways to describe the atonement of Jesus, last week I covered 20 out of 50. Today you're getting the other 30. All right, pal? So you're welcome. Happy birthday. Here we go. You guys ready for this? Six things the Lamb has done for us that is deserving of giving him all praise, glory, and honor forever and ever and ever. Number one, the Lamb chosen. Just like every Israelite family was to choose the perfect lamb, who's the one that chooses the lamb to be given for us? It is the Father. Choosing his son to give his life for us. Now here's the amazing thing about the Trinity, and I'm not even going to go deep di- do a deep dive into the Trinity. It will blow our minds. The Trinity is this, that God exists as one God and manifests himself in three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. All co-eternal, all co-substantial, all, co- all omnipotent, om- omnipresent. Um, the, the thing that differentiates the Trinity is, it, is their role in creation and salvation, primarily. So in creation, the Father comes up with a plan to create the world. He does it through the Son, Colossians chapter 1, and it's all held together by the power of the Spirit. This is why the Spirit hovers over the surface of the waters. In salvation, the Father sends the Son, the Son secures salvation, the Spirit applies that salvation to the hearts of those who would believe. That is super simplistic. Uh, that we, can, we can talk for eons about the Trinity, but we won't do it. But isn't it amazing that the Father himself chooses the Lamb to be sacrificed for us? The Son submits to the Father to do this. If you want to read how beautiful the submission is of the Son to the Father, read John chapter 17, the great high priestly prayer. Jesus says, Father, I've come to do the will, your will. I've come that they may know you. I pray that they would glorify you. I pray that the oneness that you and I share would be a oneness they would experience with each other as the church. It's so good. But... Look at these words, Matthew chapter 12. Matthew quotes Isaiah 42. Write down Isaiah 42. Look at it later. It's a great, great passage. Here's what Matthew writes in chapter 12. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. And here's what Isaiah writes. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen. This is the father talking to the son. Behold, the servant whom I have chosen 
my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. And then it says this, and I love these words of tenderness. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. This means the coming of the Messiah will be so gentle and kind. Oh, it's going gonna, it's gonna to win people. Over. And in his name, the Gentiles will have hope. You need to understand that the Lamb is chosen by God the Father himself. And this is why on the Mount of Transfiguration, Luke chapter 9, verse 35 says this. If you don't re- recall that moment, it's the moment Jesus calls the disciples. Peter, James, John goes up to a mountain, discloses his glory there on that mountain. There's also Moses and Elijah emphasizing the law and the prophets. And here's what uh, Luke chapter 9 says. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. So you need to consider the fact that the plan of God was always to send his chosen lamb to redeem those that would be his sheep. And the the flock in which this lamb was taken was the flock of humanity. And this implies his incarnation. Incarnation is God with flesh on him. This is what we celebrate at Christmas. God who came into our world, who full of grace and truth came in, not giving up his deity, but retaining his deity, but adding on humanity so that he can identify with each and every one of us. Aren't you glad that you have a Savior who's connected with you and not disconnected from you? Is amazing. So not only is there a lamb chosen, number two, there is a lamb consecrated. This is not just any lamb. This is not the fact that you could stand in and, and, and become now the sacrifice on behalf of people. Nate fell short of that an hour ago. I fell short of that 15 minutes ago. Michael fell short of that last night. Right? We all four fall short of the glory of God. There's not one of us who could step in and represent humanity faithfully. Why? Because every single one of us, the moment we woke up today, somehow we sinned. Turn to your neighbor and say, today you have sinned. (laughs) Don't do that in a mean-hearted, mean-spirited way, okay? But here's the amazing thing about Christ Jesus. Paul says this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Write this verse down. Write all these verses down. Here's what Paul says about the Lamb given for us. For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Amen? So here Christ comes into our messy world. He's ministering to sinful people. And yet here's this amazing high priest that is connected with us, but he's not sinning. He doesn't have the nature to do that, but that doesn't mean his difficulties are, are, are any less. We don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with us. We have one who can. And so here is God providing the lamb, this perfect lamb, without spot, without blemish. And the book of Hebrews tells us that Jesus was like us and that he lived a human life full of faith, free from sin with the help of the Holy Spirit. Write down these verses from Hebrews, chapter 2, verse 10. I told you you're going to work out, Debbie. You're doing a great job, all right? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. For it was fitting that he for whom and by whom all things exist in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. Christ was perfect, and yet he suffered in his perfection. Mind-blowing concept. The writer continues, chapter 4, verse 15 of Hebrews. This is such a great verse. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with us in our weakness, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Christ went to the cross perfect, spotless, blameless. Didn't deserve the death he died. Why? Because a perfect person doesn't deserve that sort of treatment. Last verse out of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 14. How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? What do you bring to the table? Here's what the writer of Hebrews says, dead works. What does Jesus bring to the table? He offers himself without blemish to purify that which we can never purify our own. Why? So that we can serve the living God. What is your purpose in being saved? To serve the living God. Point number three, the lamb condemned. 
Here's where we have a difficult time wrapping our minds around what Jesus did. This is what we would call substitution. He was condemned when I know I should have been the one condemned. You know who should have been on that cross? Me. You know who else would have been next to me? You. 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 And yet the lamb is the one condemned. Isaiah 53, verse 7, probably one of the most beautiful passages in all of Scripture. Isaiah 53, 7 says this, He was oppressed, he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that is before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. We add on to that Romans chapter 5, verse 8, and that God demonstrates his own love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ dies for us. He stands in our place. This is what we would call the great exchange. Write that phrase down, great exchange. His righteousness for our sinfulness. Are are you kidding me? You're, You're willing to die for me? Now, for a righteous man, people might go, I'm willing to die for him. But for a person as sinful, as disobedient, as rebellious as me, who's gonna die for me? Jesus steps in. And gives his life for this wretched creature named Scott Morgan. The great exchange is this. He lives a life of perfect righteousness so that that righteousness can be credited to my account. And he takes from me my sinfulness, the very sin that separates me from a holy God. And you know, he becomes condemned so that now I become accepted. You know, the message of Good Friday is this, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You know, the message of Easter is, my God, my God, why have you accepted me? And here it is. Why? Because number four, the lamb is cursed. You know what happened on that cross some 2,000 years ago? The wrath of the Father, which should be poured out on me, is poured out on his Son. And this is why the son cries out on that cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was this moment of intense forsakenness that you and I will never, ever experience because of his sacrifice on our behalf. You and I deserve the wrath of the father. The son takes it. He becomes the curse. And this is why Galatians chapter 3, one of the most amazing letters on that you are saved by grace and you're not saved by works. If anyone comes to you preaching a different gospel, let them be accursed. Chapter 3, verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Let me just say, the law is a curse. The law reminds us how far we fall short, but it can never point us in how to be redeemed. This is why Christ becomes the law. Christ becomes the one who absorbs what the law demands and credits our account now with the law's demands, which we can never do for ourselves, and that's righteousness. So Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree. And then in the next chapter, here's what Paul says in chapter 4 of Galatians. But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law so that we might receive adoption as sons. Can I get a hallelujah from somebody? That right there, you guys. Some of you are like, there's a lot of scripture today. You want to know why there's a lot of scripture? You you don't want to hear what I have to say. You need to hear what God's word says. Right? I might come up with some pithy antidotes, but you know what? Nothing compares to the word of God. And Paul writes these words and says to you, think about what Christ has endured for us. That he didn't come to, to, to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And this is why now there's no condemnation for those of us in Christ Jesus. We now stand accepted. Why? Because he became a curse for us. You don't have to concern yourself whether God likes you. He loves you. Brings us to our fifth point. We're almost done. The lamb covers You know what the Lamb has now covered you with? Righteousness. The Bible says you are naked, you are unclothed, you are poor, you have nothing, but the the Lamb comes and covers you with his robe of righteousness. 
and now you're secure in God's love forever. The mercy seat of God has been covered with the Lamb's blood, and now all the hostility and animosity that exists between you and the Father has been assuaged by the propitiation of Christ Jesus himself. I know I just used a couple big words. Let me explain that to you. Assuaged is God directing his anger. You no longer have anger of God directed towards you. The Lamb has now taken it. So the, the Lamb has assuaged the anger of God, satisfied the anger, and become our propitiation, meaning our substitute. He has taken what we have deserved. Write down Romans 3.25. Write down 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. Write down 1 John chapter 4, verse 10. I know. Lucas, I know. I'm feeling it, bro. Pineapple brothers. All right, here we go. All right. Corn dogs, watermelons. It's, it's good, you guys. It's good. Yeah, right. So the lamb covers. Let me give you a couple verses um, if I haven't done so already. Uh, Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 through 14. I love Colossians. Colossians is so good. My life verse comes out of Colossians. I'll talk about that later. For you, you were dead in your trespasses and uncircumcision of your flesh. God made alive together with him. So God makes you alive. We're dead. God is the acting agent that turns our hearts of stone into hearts of flesh. We're dead. He makes us alive. Having forgiven us all our trespasses. How many of our sins has God forgiven? All of them. There are too many Christians I run into, and they're like, I think God has forgiven me of most of my sins. I go, most? Which ones are you holding out on? Like, I'm really curious about which sins you think God has not taken care of. Here's what the Bible says. He has forgiven us all our trespasses. How? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. Circle that, and that's law. That's law right there. And he's done this by setting it aside, nailing it to the cross. And the next verse says, and he does this and triumphs over all his enemies. And I would add uh, Romans chapter 8, and if God is for us, who can be against us? You guys, there's no better message than this. That the Lamb has covered us and cleansed us and redeemed us and canceled all of our sins and nullifies the power of the flesh and has now set us up for victory together. And this is why probably 1 Peter chapter 1 is so remarkable, verses 18 through 20. Here's what Peter writes. Knowing that you were ransomed from feudal ways, inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. So he, here's what we can't miss. We have this inherited nature, sin. Nothing can deliver us, no silver nor gold, nor religious observances, nor good works. There's only one thing that can ransom you, and that's the precious blood of Christ. Like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake, sake of you. So here's what I hear in this. If I understand what God has done for me, I am not going to take my life in Christ, treat it trivially. I want to live my utmost for his highest. I'm stealing the title of a book by a guy named Oswald Chambers. But I love it. Right? Like, why should I give God anything less considering what he's given to me? You know what this, the, that Peter passage motivates me to do? It motivates me to live a life of holiness and godliness and purity. To live a life of sanctification, maturity, discipline, discipleship. This is why I pray for you as a church community. Father, may they live their lives in a manner reflective of the calling you have shown them in Christ Jesus. Like all of us should consider the weightiness of what we spend our time, treasures, and talents on. If he has given you his only son, what is there that I should not come before him with and say, I want to live for your glory? In everything I do and say, whether I eat or drink, do it all for the glory of God. 
And we bring it to our last point, and it's this. The lamb crowned. The lamb crowned. Oh, this is a good one. Because where's the, where's the lamb now? Seated at the right hand of the Father. Where's the lamb now? In that heavenly place. Where's that lamb now? Being sung to, being rejoiced over, being adored. You know, the picture is, is in the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, you know, lists the lamb no less than 29 times. That's, that's 1.3 times per chapter in Revelation. And I'm not even good with math. I, I, I don't even read the book of Numbers in the Bible. That's how poor I am with math. But 29 times the Lamb is mentioned in Revelation, and the Lamb is mentioned as one who has overcome, one who has redeemed his saints, one who is ransoming those who have had their robes washed in the blood of the Lamb, the ones whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life, right? The picture of Revelation is this in chapter 5, verses 11 through 14. Here's the scene. I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels, numbering myriads and myriads, thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Ladies and gentlemen, the Lamb has always been the center of everything. And the Lamb will be the center of everything that matters for time and eternity. Amen, church? The fact is this. The party of the Lamb will reign forever. The Lamb who opens the seals. The Lamb who has poured out His wrath on unbelievers. The Lamb whose blood wash, uh, he, has, he has redeemed those waters in his blood. He's enabled his people to triumph. The book contains their names. Oh, what glory is due to the Lamb of God slain for us. And so if you want to read the end of the story, read Revelation. Specifically chapters 20, 21, and 22. Knowing that we've been ransomed. Knowing that the perfect Lamb has been given for us. Knowing that your name has been written in the Lamb's book of life. May it spur us on to live lives of holiness and obedience and righteousness today and forever. What has God not given to you? What is, what is it that you lack that you just feel like God hasn't provided for you? Is Jesus your everything? Because if he is, then in Christ is your everything. May God be glorified in our lives today and forever. Amen, church? Let's stand. Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. I'm, I'm humbled, Father, because who am I to even delve into topics like this? I feel the weightiness of it. I, I feel the responsibility of it. Somehow, some way, Lord, I think your message has got across. These, these are the themes that we will be rejoicing over for the rest of our lives and for eternity. I pray that we have got a taste of it today. I pray that somehow we have, we have just once again just connected the salvation we have to the Savior who's brought it to us. Thank you for such an indescribable salvation. Thank you so much for the immeasurable riches of your, your grace. Thank you that there are things that are so lofty that we have a hard time wrapping our minds around it. But all we can declare at the end of the day is, hallelujah, what a Savior. Worthy is the Lamb who has been slain for us. Help us to live lives, finding our everything in, in, in Jesus. Help us to continue to give thankfulness to you and praise to you and honor to you. Help us to live lives that reflect the precious blood that has been spilled for us. Thank you, Father, for giving us your only son. We no longer face death, but now we have eternal life. Help us to live in that joy forever. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Amen. Love you guys. We'll have a Rocky Point trip meeting here in 15 minutes. Love you guys. See you soon.